Hello everyone, welcome to the University of Maryland Extension's Zooming into Healthy Horsekeeping webinar series. We're excited to have all of you joining us live for this presentation and for those of you that are listening on later to this recording. My name is Jennifer Reynolds, the Extension Activity Coordinator for equine and poultry programs at the University of Maryland. I will be assisting as host with some of the behind the scenes and question wrangling for today. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Andy Ness. Andy is the agriculture educator for Harford County Extension here in Maryland. He attended the University of Delaware where he earned his bachelor's degree in plant sciences and then a master's in plant pathology. One of the focuses of his program here with Maryland Extension is working with livestock producers to improve the performance of their pastures and forages. We're very pleased to have him with us today and are excited for him to talk about a topic that is always, always coming up for all of us. That is weed worries, managing weeds in horse pastures. All right, thank you very much for the introduction, Jen. And thank you all for hopping on here on a beautiful uh, afternoon here. So as Jen said, we're gonna talk a little bit about weed management today. So, you know, how do you go from this on the left, which is a weedy mess, to something that's very pretty and um, has a lot of forage for your horses to eat on the right? So that's what I wanna talk about today. But one thing that I wanna drive home right off the bat is gonna be this. Um, weed management in pastures takes time, it takes dedication, and it takes effort. Um, plants are not a static being, they are living just like horses, so they require maintenance and upkeep. Uh, so we need to be sure that we are promoting the health of our forages uh, and that will in turn suppress weeds. So the number one rule, if you didn't take anything away from this, is going to be a dense healthy forage stand will outcompete weeds. And that's really what we're after when we're trying to talk about weed management in pastures. Okay, so it's going to be a, a constant process. It requires effort. Um, and it also requires a uh, comprehensive and integrated approach. So not one single tool is going to do it for you. You need to have all the tools in your toolbox in order to have a successful weed management program for your pastures. So what I want to do today is I want to talk about basically the tools that we have at our disposal. How do we use them in unison to manage weeds? <clears throat> So I'm going to talk about and briefly touch on soils and plant selection in your pastures. We're going to talk about pasture management because that's going to be an important factor. And then I'm going to talk about some other important weed control tools. And then at the very end, I'm going to talk about the types of weeds that we have, sort of breaking them down in different categories and what we need to know in order to manage those specific types of weeds. Again, if you guys have questions as we go along, please put them in the chat box and I will get to them and answer them to the best of my ability. Okay, so let's talk about the foundation uh, of, of a healthy pasture and weed management. And that's gonna be start right. So set yourself up for success, not failure. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about the soil. And this is really where it all starts. Okay, think of this like the foundation on your house. You can spend all the money and put all the resources to build an extravagant house or building or whatever it is, barn, what have you. Um, but if it doesn't have a good foundation, it's going to crumble. And you wasted all that money, time, and effort to build something very nice um, just to have it fall apart. So really, your soils are your foundation. This is where it starts. So if you've never taken a soil test, uh, I highly encourage you to do that. Um, that's going to be step one, and that should be part of your management plans moving forward for as long as you're going to keep pastures, okay? It's going to be soil tests every one to three years. That's going to be the benchmark and the baseline to uh, making management decisions on your pasture. And one of those management decisions is going to be related to maintaining optimum pH. It's going to be very important. Um, I'll touch on that here in a second. And also, that soil test is going to give you a bench line and recommendations for a fertility program for your pasture. 
okay? And we'll talk about that here in a second as well. Now, this is not a soils talk or a nutrient management talk, so I'm not gonna get into the weeds per se with that. If you want more information about soils and about soil testing, uh, I did a webinar earlier in the series about uh, how to read a soil test and, and make management decisions based off of it. The link is there. You can find that on our YouTube channel, the Maryland Horse YouTube channel. Um, and also you can get some other resources about soil sampling and nutrient management from our Ag and Nutrient Management uh, Extension Program on our website at, at extension.umd.edu slash ANMP. There's a ton of resources on there uh, that can really get you started. Uh, another thing is, feel free to contact your local extension office, talk with your ag agent or with your nutrient management advisor in your county in Maryland, um, and they'd be happy to give you resources and information about soil testing. I do want to touch on pH. This is going to be something very important. Um, if you look, tuned into my other webinar, this graph would look familiar. Um, but the reason soil pH is important is because it influences the availability of nutrients to your plant, all right? So once we, if we fall outside of this optimum range, which is between six and seven, if we fall either above or below that, you can see that nutrient availability goes down in a lot of cases outside of that range. Um, so what this means is you might have all the phosphorus in the world in your soil, but if you start to fall below that 6.0 pH, it doesn't matter how much phosphorus is in that soil, it doesn't matter how much phosphorus you fertilize with, your plants can't get to that nutrient and utilize it. So we really need to be sure that we're putting our, our plants in that optimum pH range of six to seven. So that's gonna be a huge uh, factor to look for in your soil test is to monitor your pH and adjust accordingly and keep it in that range. Another thing that soil test is going to tell you is going to be the fertility, okay? What are the levels of, of your nutrients in the soil? Phosphorus, potassium, sulfur. Um, you might get some micronutrients in there as well. Um, but just like your horses, you know, we feed horses forage to let them grow. Well, plants need it too. So they need food as well. So we need to fertilize them in some way, all right? So uh, yes, you might have animals on pasture. Yes, they deposit manure. Yes, that manure has nutrients in it. But in a lot of cases, it's not meeting the full nutrient demand of it, your, your, your pastures and your forages really need. So we oftentimes have to supplement that with either spreading manure or some other uh, types of fertilizer sources in order to build those levels up to sufficient levels to promote healthy plant growth. And that healthy plant growth is going to uh, work to choke out and shade weeds. So use your soil test. Um, a lot of the local labs or wherever you send it, um, they're gonna come up with some recommendations. Follow those recommendations, they're good. Um, you can also work with a nutrient management advisor uh, in your county to get a nutrient management plan. Um, even if you don't have to have one by law, it's not a bad thing to have, especially if you want some more guidance and recommendations on how to fertilize your pastures because it will break down the amount of fertilizer you should apply, the amount of lime you should apply, and when to apply those, those nutrients uh, sources. So it can be a very useful tool even if you don't need it by law, you know, to have it um, can be very helpful. Another thing that I want to briefly touch on is going to be forage selection. Uh, so you want to choose the right forage uh, for your pasture, okay? So for your soil types and for your goals and needs of that pasture. Um, so what do I mean by that? Well, you know, plants, they're different species of forages. They're adapted for different conditions, okay? So if you have a, a poorly drained pasture that, that tends to hold a lot of water, that's not an area that I would plant orchard grass in because orchard grass likes to have well-drained fertile soils. That would be something that you would want to explore other options, other types of forages, maybe tall fescue, reed canary grass, things that can tolerate that type of environment. Because it doesn't matter what you do to orchard grass in a poorly drained field, it's just not going to grow well, it's going to die. And then of course you're going to have weeds moving in because they're opportunistic. So choose the right forage. Um, 
Amanda Grev, our forage specialist, did a, a presentation about forage selection. Uh, so that is also found on our YouTube channel if you want to uh, look at that webinar. Uh, just Google it again on our, our uh, YouTube channel. Also, there's a great publication that was put together by Dr. Wes Bowe, who was our forage specialist uh, prior to Amanda. Uh, and this can be found on our extension website, on our horses resources uh, tab, um, specifically the one for guidelines for seeding new pastures and renovating old pastures. This breaks down um, seeding rates and recommended species for certain soil types and, and soil conditions. So it really breaks it down um, into what will perform in certain sites uh, to uh, maximize plant growth. So those are some two really good resources that I would highly recommend. Um, if you have trouble finding them, just let me know and I'll get them to you. So let's touch on pasture management. Uh, and really what I'm talking about when I say pasture management is really maintaining adequate um, uh, leaf material in your plants so that you're not stressing them too much. So AKA don't overgraze. So your pasture should not look like a putting green, right? So those plants need to have leaf material in order for them to function and, and be healthy. So if we look at the graph on the right, I really like this. Uh, it shows uh, a grass that's been clipped either 30 percent, 50, 60, or 80 percent. And keep in mind that when you remove leaf material, so when it's either grazed or you clip it or mow it or what have you, what happens is you're also clipping the amount of roots that that plant has as well. Uh, so what that plant does is in order to push new growth, new leaf material, it takes root reserves and root stores. Basically it sacrifices some roots in order to push up new shoots. Um, so you can see there, when you get down to um, taking off, let's see, down here we have 60% leaf material removed. You're clipping off uh, about half of the plant's roots. And if you clip it beyond 50%, this is where it really starts to fall off. You know, uh, you're, you're going to, or when you get down to 70% that you're taking off, you're almost removing all the roots. You're removing somewhere close to 80%. So keep that in mind. Um, so how do we manage that? And there's a couple of things you can do. Um, you basically, you never want to take your, your, your plants down below about four inches, okay? So if you're grazing a pasture or a paddock um, and it starts to get to that four inch mark, that's gonna be a signal for, that's when you need to move them, okay? Put those animals somewhere else or take them off of there and feed them hay, okay? Allow that paddock to regrow, um, preferably getting up to eight inches at least, um, at the bare minimum six inches uh, but somewhere in that eight to 10 inches tall before you would allow um, your animals, your horses to return to that paddock and graze it again. And again, only taking it down to that four inches. So you get below that four inches, we're really gonna stress those plants a lot. They're not gonna persist, they're gonna die. And then what's gonna take its place? A weed, okay? Because weeds are opportunistic. So we can also manage grazing height by rotational grazing. Uh, so setting up different paddocks, breaking them down smaller. I'll mention that a little bit uh, in the next slide. Um, but rotational grazing can provide a lot of benefits, and you don't have to have a real fancy uh, system. You know, you can use temporary fences and, and break the paddocks down uh, into smaller areas. Uh, and I'll touch on that in a minute. But also adjusting your stocking rate. Uh, so this is something that a lot of uh, small acreage horse owners battle with is stocking rates. So, uh, you know, if we start to get horse horses more than you know uh, one and a half acres per horse, then or anything less than that, uh, then you're really going to be stressing them as plants. So I like to tell folks if you're especially in a continuously grazed pasture, that two acres per ho per horse is a good place to start. And then maybe if you implement some really good management and rotational grazing, you could uh, push that number, you know, you can maybe get uh, two horses maybe um, in that acre. So it depends on how well you're managing that system, um, but really don't set yourself up for failure by putting too many animals on that pasture at once. 
So I do want to mention rotational grazing. So here is sort of a, a just a diagram of what it is. Uh, so on the far left, you have a continually grazed system. Uh, so the pasture is just one pasture. It's not divided into smaller units, um, whereas the one in the middle is divided into four paddocks. And those animals are rotated through those paddocks once that they graze it down to four inches, they move to the next one, and then it allows the first paddock to rest. And that rest period is very important. That allows the plants to push up new growth and get back to that, you know, six, eight, 10 inch tall before they're returned and grazed again. Um, and then the smaller you make the paddocks, um, the more intensely they're gonna be grazed and, and they're probably gonna have to be moved through here faster uh, because the paddocks are smaller. Um, but having smaller paddocks and more of them, um, we can typically achieve longer rest periods. So um, what rotational grazing does is it, is it mimics what naturally occurs in basically with grasses out in nature. Because um, grasses evolved with livestock or with animals grazing on them. Um, it's just that in, in nature, what would happen is a herd would come through, they would graze it, and then they would move off. They would not return back to that for really a whole growing season. Uh, so what rotational grazing does is try to, to get back and mimic that sort of natural cycle and allow that resting period for your forages. So in a continually grazed system, uh, what you're gonna have is your horses are gonna preferentially graze certain areas. So they're gonna overgraze certain spots and they're really gonna undergraze other spots. Um, and this is sort of an extreme example of it here, um, but also you're all going to have manure deposited uh, more infrequently and not spread as evenly. Okay, so that's also what you're seeing in this picture as well, where manure was deposited. That's why those plants are a little bit higher. But what the the overall uh, take home point here is with the continuously grazed system, you're going to get a lot of inconsistencies in your pasture. So you're going to have some plants that are really over uh, overgrazed and some that are way undergrazed and that inconsistency is not what you're striving for. What we're really looking for is uniformity. Um, so installing more paddocks and rotational grazing can get you closer to uniformity, which is your friend, right? So again, proper grazing management promotes healthy forage growth and that's what's going to outcompete your weeds, okay? And also, proper grazing management acts as a type of mechanical weed control because clipping, um, having your animals graze that uh, paddock properly is also going to help to clip weeds as well and keep them from producing seed. Uh, a lot of our weeds that we have, they really do provide decent forage. Um, it's just that when they get to producing seed, they get to be very unpalatable uh, for livestock and then that's when they become reproductive nightmares. Um, they start to produce seed and things like that and makes the problem worse. So uh, the, the, the mechanical control that uh, just by grazing it properly will help keep weeds at bay as well. So I already talked about soil fertility and pH but always keep that in the back of your mind and that's going to be sort of the basis of, of everything that you're doing. Um, it's going to be proper pH, proper fertility. Again, select that proper fertilizer or that proper forward species. Uh, you already talked about don't overgrazing. Okay, I want to touch more on clipping and grazing uh, and mowing and then also on chemical control. So clipping, basically what we want to do in this scenario is we always want to keep our plants in the vegetative growth stage. Okay, so how do we do that and what does that look like? Well, when you start to see flowers, that means the plant is no longer in a vegetative growth stage. That means that it's going into a reproductive growth stage. In the case of grasses, uh, this is orchard grass, I think it's pictured here. It's kind of blurry, sorry. Um, but when we start to see seed heads, that's when that plant is going from a vegetative growth stage into a reproductive growth stage. Um, that's undesirable from a forage quality standpoint because once these plants get very stemmy, uh, those stems become lignified and they're really not very palatable or provide much forage um, energy density. Um, so we'd really like to keep those plants in those vegetative growth stage. So how do you do that? Well, again, proper grazing, uh, keeping them at that height. 
uh, between that four and 10 inches will keep those plants from setting seed like that. Um, but also melling. So if you start to see plants set seed and throw seed heads out like this, you know, don't be afraid to clip it uh, and get rid of those seed heads. Um, there is some people, there is sort of a misnomer that um, I've heard uh, some folks want their their pastures to go to seed because they think that the seed production will then lead to a thicker stand in the future. And really that's not true. Um, these forage species that we have, you know, they're domesticated plants. Um, we've bred them over several, several hundreds and thousands of years to provide desirable forage quality and not necessarily to just self-seed themselves. So um, our, our forage species in general, they don't self-sow very well. Um, it would be the equivalent of taking your, your dog and just letting it go and, and expecting it to fend for itself uh, out in the wild. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. So um, when you start to see anything going to seed, it's really best to knock that seed head off before it produces hard seed. Um, also with other weed species that are broadleaf type weeds, again, the same holds true. Don't let them go to flower and go set seed. So the mower is your friend, okay? It's gonna provide a lot of benefits for you in terms of weed control and forage quality. You know, it's gonna help you keep plants in vegetative growth stage, right? And it's gonna improve forage quality. Your horses are gonna graze it better and more uniformly, okay? Again, it's gonna keep your weeds from going to seed. You know, as soon as you start to see them go to seed, you can mow them back. Um, and it also aids in keeping your pastures uniform. And that uniformity is gonna make management a lot easier. So don't be afraid to mow. Just as a reminder, when you're mowing, don't mow it below four inches. Again, that four inches is really gonna be your cutoff. Now you might run into situations in the early spring, uh, where there's, or in, in spring when we have a real flush of forage growth. Um, and sometimes you might even have an excess. Uh, so don't be afraid to mow that excess as those plants start to, um, to head out or uh, cut it and bale it and then you can utilize that as a feed source later on when um, you get into the summer slump or over winter. So this is the part where I want to talk about chemistry and chemical control. Um, it is a tool in our toolbox and I do want to point out this excellent reference and excellent resource and bring it to your attention um, because this can really make your life a lot easier. Um, so with, with chemistry, so we're talking about herbicides here, um, what the active ingredient is, so the chemistry and the timing of that herbicide is vastly important. It can be the difference between a really effective uh, weed control spray and something that just totally didn't work at all. Um, so this is the Mid-Atlantic Field Crop Weed Management Guide. I highly recommend it. It is a collaborative publication that's produced um, by the Mid-Atlantic Land Grant University Extension Services, so Penn State, uh, University of Delaware, University of Maryland, Rutgers, Virginia Tech, um, and West Virginia. You can purchase this on Penn State's website. They do all the publishing. Um, if you just Google Mid-Atlantic, field crop weed management guide. It's gonna be the first thing that pops up. It's gonna take you to this page here on Penn State's website. You can purchase this. Um, you can get a digital copy for $15. You can get a print copy for I think $35 or $25, I'm sorry. Or you could get both for $35. Um, it's a good worthwhile investment if you're gonna be doing um, some uh, herbicide applications on your farm, especially if you're doing it yourself uh, or you just want to make sure you're using the right product when you have someone else do it. And this can be a super helpful guide. Um, these are just some uh, snippets that I took out of it. So basically what it does is it breaks everything down. It's super user friendly. Um, it gives relative effectiveness of herbicides on different weed species. You can see that in this table on the left. Um, it'll also give you recommended timings for herbicide application on that table on the right. And 
there's also a lot of notes and uh, things that it points out, restrictions, tips, tricks, things like that about specific herbicides that you want to know. And so again, really useful guide. Um, if there's specific parts of it and such, um, you know, feel free to contact me. I can get you those as well. Um, and it's a great reference. So I do want to mention active ingredients uh, on herbicide labels. So active ingredient is really what's going to help you uh, that, uh, uh, choose an herbicide. Uh, so if we go back up here, um, a lot of these different uh, herbicides, obviously they have different active ingredients. So the active ingredient is the chemical that's actually doing the weed control process. So on the label, you're always going to find it pretty much right under the trade name. And in these two cases here, uh, these are two different herbicides that we use on pastures, uh, but they have different active ingredients. Um, and the reason that's important is because those active ingredients, they work uh, on certain weeds. So it's good to know what the active ingredients are. And you can reference uh, those active ingredients with uh, effectiveness uh, in those herbicide control tables. So here we can see AIM is uh, carfentrazone, whereas Crossbow is a combination of 2,4-D and triclopyr. So just in case anyone's not aware of where to find active ingredients, that's where they are. They're right on the herbicide label, pretty much right on the, the very front page. In reference to herbicides, we do have sort of different categories that you can split them down, split them up into. So um, there are systemic herbicides. So this is the chemical is, uh, it's applied to actively growing plants. Uh, the plant absorbs the chemical through its leaves, and then it's, that chemical is translocated. Uh, so it's moved down through uh, the phloem of the plant and gets into the roots. And once it's in the roots, there's specific receptors in the roots that the chemical binds to, and it disrupts um, certain biological processes in the root, ultimately killing the plant. Um, these systemic herbicides are, um, usually pretty good at, at managing um, perennial weeds where we really need to get the, to kill the root. Um, a good example of a systemic herbicide is one that I'm sure everyone's heard of is glyphosate or Roundup. Um, that is a product that is uh, translocated to the roots and that's where it kills the plant. Now they differ from contact herbicides. Contact herbicides only kill the tissues of the plants that it comes in contact with. So these are going to be leaves and shoots. Um, a good example of this would be something like Ramoxone or Paraquat. Uh, it's only going to kill that tissue that it comes in contact with. Um, if the plant has the capability, uh, again, uh, like perennial weeds, it will uh, sprout new shoots from roots if it has that ability. But if it's something like an annual weed, um, it's going to kill the plant. Now we do have um, selective and non-selective herbicides. And what we mean there is uh, some herbicides have the ability to target specific types of plants. So an example of a selective herbicide would be something like 2,4-D or dicamba, where they will kill broadleaf plants, uh, but they will not kill grasses, okay? So if you're trying to manage broadleaf weeds in a pasture, uh, a selective herbicide will manage those weeds while keeping your grasses uh, untouched and healthy. Um, now keep in mind that uh, clover is a broadleaf plant, so um, if you do have clover and you're trying to keep clover in your pastures, um, uh, with something like 2,4-D or dicamba will kill your clover as well, so just be aware of that. We also have products that are applied either pre-emerge or post-emerge. So a product that's applied pre-emerge needs to go out um, before a seed germinates and get soaked into the soil. And as the seed germinates, that seed uh, takes up the chemical and then kills the germinating seed. Uh, these can be useful for annual type weeds, um, specifically some summer annuals. Um, and that differs from post-emergent applications where the plant has to be up and actively growing and then the herbicide is applied. So those are some different types of uh, chemicals, sort of classes. Uh, 
that we're dealing with. And I just wanted to touch on the types of weeds that we have here that we typically face in Maryland, Mid-Atlantic weed region, and some uh, pointers on how to manage them. So I'm gonna break them up into different categories. Uh, and these different categories are gonna be important with how you manage them. So the first one I'm gonna talk about are winter annuals. Now, this time of year, you're not gonna see any winter annuals. Um, basically what they do is they germinate in the fall. They germinate from seed. Um, they become itty bitty plants in the fall where they will overwinter, they'll go dormant. And then in the following spring, they're gonna grow super duper fast. They're gonna flower and then they're gonna drop seed again and then the cycle repeats. So the way to control winter annual weeds is gonna to be to get them killed before they produce seed in the spring. Uh, okay, so control them by clipping them before they set hard seed in the spring. Um, and I'll explain that here in a second. Or um, a chemical control option would be to control them while they're itty bitty little plants in the fall with an herbicide application or, or in the early spring before they really start to grow a lot. So some common pasture annual, winter annual weeds that we see um, on the left, that's field pennycress. Um, shepherd's purse is also a very similar weed um, we see there. So by this point here, what you're seeing, these are all the, basically the seed pods. At this point, this plant has pretty much set probably hard seed. Um, so milling it at this point or doing anything really at this point is gonna be too late. You really need to get this plant killed off and clipped off when it's actively flowering. So these guys will have pretty little yellow flowers um, and that's when you would want to manage them uh, by clipping. Uh, at this point it's better to just wait and you could do that clipping in the spring of the following year or what you could do is uh, in the fall come in with the, the broadleaf uh, herbicide to kill them as baby plants. Um, down in the in the soil. In the middle is uh, is purple death nettle. Um, also, another similar species is henbit. Uh, these are in the mint family. They're broadleaf weeds, uh, and they produce these pretty little purple flowers in the spring, which I'm sure everyone has probably seen at one time or another. Again, for this guy, this would be the time to control it with mowing or clipping. Um, the problem with death nettle is that it doesn't really get super tall, so it can sometimes still produce viable seed below four inches. Um, uh, this is where something like spot treatments um, could come, could be effective um, using like Roundup or whatnot, you know, a small area that you might have an outbreak. Or you could even uh, take a mower or a weed whacker and get rid of those guys really low in the spring in those problem areas. And then finally on the right is just a generic mustard. I'm not really sure what species this is, but we do get a lot of mustards that come up in the spring. And again, their control is gonna be the same. You either have to get them in the fall when they're, they're small, or early spring when they're still small, or wait until they produce these flowers and then clip them off. Now, another type of annual weed that we have are going to be summer annuals. Um, you can probably see where we're going with this. So um, these guys are summer loving and heat loving species. So they actually germinate in the late spring. Um, and when I say late spring, I'm really talking about, uh, depending on the year, this is going to be, you know, mid April through May. Um, really when the soil temperatures get up around 50 to 55 degrees is when these seeds are gonna to start to germinate. So they're gonna, they're gonna germinate then. Um, and then what they're gonna do is sort of hang out as small plants, but then as soon as it really starts to get warm, as we get into late spring, uh, early summer, what they're gonna do is enter a period of rapid growth and they're gonna send up a flower head. They're gonna produce seed um, in the midsummer to early fall and they're gonna die and then the cycle repeats. So again, control these weeds by clipping them before they set that hard seed in the summer or the fall, okay? Um, chemical controls can be applied. They're most effective in the late spring to the um, early summer for these guys. Um, a lot of pre-emerge controls and I'll talk about that in a minute. 
um, some, can sometimes be very effective for some of our grass species that are uh, summer annuals. Uh, these are some broadleaf summer annual plants. So on the left is our uh, is uh, a pigweed species, uh, spiny amaranth, uh, common pasture weed. Uh, in the middle, we have um, uh, jimson weed, and it produces this pretty wicked fruiting body right here that has the seeds inside of it. Um, and then on the right is um, is um, nightshade, and again, uh, nightshade. These are the the fruits, and they'll contain the seeds. So all of these guys here, we want to get rid of them before they get to producing these fruiting bodies. Right? So again if that's going to be mechanical control through clipping or grazing or if that's going to be through chemical control we want to get rid of these before any of these flowering structures and reproductive structures uh, have hard seed in them. Now we do have some common uh, summer annual weeds that are grasses. Um, on the far left is uh, foxtail. We have several different species of foxtail that are most common are going to be yellow, green, and giant foxtail. Uh, they all germinate when the soil temperatures get around that 50 degree mark. Um, and they become problematic because of their seed heads. Um, I'm sure you guys know this, but they can be particularly um, problematic for horses and cause a lot of irritation from the gums and such, uh, those barbs on the seed head. So get rid of those before they produce those, those seed heads like that. Um, there are some products on the market that you can apply pre-emerge, so they need to go in um, about late, uh, about um, mid-April or so, early April to mid-April, uh, that will kill the germinating foxtail seeds. Uh, in the middle, we have a picture of crabgrass. Now, crabgrass is very common in this area, and it's really not that bad of a forage, uh, but you can manage them. Uh, with control measures by mowing them or clipping them before they produce seed or again with the uh, pre-emerge herbicides. And then the one on the right is Japanese stiltgrass, uh, a very problematic weed that really becomes very uh, aggressive and invasive, especially in low-lying areas where uh, a lot of our forages uh, tend not to grow very well. Um, this is also a summer annual, so it will come back from seed every year. So really concentrate on uh, keeping these guys from producing seed. And again, pre-emerge herbicide options uh, can help manage them as well. Uh, a big one for Japanese stiltgrass is also going to be selecting the right forage to, to compete with it. Uh, so you really need to focus on forages that um, perform better in those low-lying kind of swampy areas. Now we also have perennial weeds. Now perennial weeds, they persist year to year. Um, they go dormant in the winter time, but they come back every year from either stems or roots. Um, and a lot of these guys have these overwintering structures. They either have very extensive root systems or uh, crowns and, and uh, overwintering structures that allow them to persist. So this is a terrible picture I have on the right, but I do like it. Um, this is Canada thistle, which is a a perennial weed. Um, and this is one plant. You're actually looking at one single plant that they put in there after two years of growth. And you can see the very extensive weeds uh, root system that it has. And this is why perennial weeds can be very um, problematic to manage is just because they have so much reserve energy in these root systems that we can keep knocking these guys back up top, but they have so much energy to push new growth from beneath the soil. So they become a, a challenge. Um, the way we have to get these guys is basically stress them out repeatedly. Um, knocking those, uh, knocking those uh, above ground leaves and, and shoots off, uh, really stressing that plant. Uh, so you can knock them back by, grow, by grazing, mowing, spraying. Um, but typically this is gonna be a, these types of weeds take a lot of time to get under control um, and it really, it's not something that you're going to get in one or two growing seasons. It's really going to be something that you're going to have to work at over several years. Um, perennial weeds are also going to be 
uh, something you really want to get under control the best you can prior to even establishing a pasture. Um, and so, you know, really good weed control the, the year or two leading up to seeding a new pasture or a new paddock is really going to help you control perennial weeds. Now for chemistry, um, we usually have the most effectiveness with uh, applying chemicals to perennial weeds when they're A, either very small before they get to this point to where they're so established, or B, um, just prior to flowering is a good time to, to spray perennial weeds. The reason being is um, at that point they're going to be sending a lot of reserves from the shoots down to the roots. And um, when they're doing that, uh, they could be translating the chemistry to the herbicide down to the roots too to get, um, and that's where the, the chemistry would, would work to kill the roots. So uh, with perennial weeds, those are your two most effective times uh, to manage them. We do have a lot of different perennial type weeds in pastures. I uh, already mentioned Canada thistle. Um, I'm sure everyone has seen buttercup at one point or another. Well, that's another particularly problematic one um, and one that can tolerate close mowing. So that's a, a problem one. Uh, milkweed, dogbane, chicory, dandelion, dock, horse nettle, plantain. There's a lot. Um, so these are ones that you really need to pay a lot of attention to and really work at to get under control. Now there is something that's sort of in between an annual and a perennial and they are biennials. Um, basically these guys live for about two growing seasons and then they're done. Um, they germinate from seed in the first year uh, and they grow in that first year in this sort of rosette, a compact form of rosette. Uh, and then the following year what they'll do is they'll, they'll bolt and that bolt is basically just rapid growth uh, where they're going to produce a flowering stalk. Uh, so the best way to, to control biennials is to clip them before they produce those hard seeds again in that second year when they bolt and flower. Um, but also chemical control, the best way to get these guys is to, um, is to spray them when they're still very small, so in that rosette form. So that's generally in the late fall or the early spring when they're still in that vegetative growth state. So this is just um, a picture of a bull thistle, which is also a, past, a common pasture weed. And this is it in its rosette stage. So still very compact to the ground. And this is when we would want to treat it. Um, and then in the following year, what it's going to do is it's going to produce a long stalk and it's going to flower and those are the flowers there. Um, and we would want to get rid of those flowers as well so that we don't have uh, an increase in our, our weed seed bank. So I do see one comment in the chat box real quick. Um, will the recommended book talk about best herbicides for pre and post emergent spraying for each weed? Um, and yes, um, it will. Again, very user-friendly manual. Um, it'll rank effectiveness of different herbicides um, relative to each other and also give you the best recommended timing to apply those herbicides. So uh, yeah, it's a tremendous resource. Um, uh, it is updated yearly, um, but you don't have to purchase it every year. The changes really aren't that dramatic. Um, maybe if you want to purchase one, you know, a copy of it, digital copy or whatnot, every few years, it would probably keep you in the loop. So just quickly in review, um, again, don't forget about your foundation, forget about your starting point. That's going to be your sole pH and fertility. Uh, always work to maintain those. Um, choosing the right forage, so don't try to put a forage that's not going to perform well in a site. Uh, you're just going to be asking for problems. So optimize um, your forages, put them in the right spot in the right soil types. Um, never graze or mow below that four inches. Okay, so four inches is your friend. Um, and identify the weeds that you have. Um, and again, that's going to be important because as we see 
Um, you have different management styles for those leads depending on the life cycle that they, um, that they have. I do have some additional thoughts here. Um, again, don't be afraid to mow or make hay. Again, keep those plants in that vegetative growth state. If you have a really large flush, uh, too much pasture than you can really utilize in the spring, don't be afraid to make hay off of it if you can, or at the very least mow that to keep those plants and the weeds from setting hard seed. Uh, look at trying to establish a rotational grazing system if you can. Um, it doesn't have to be extravagant. Um, if you can get some sort of rotation in there to give your paddocks a rest, that's really going to go a long way in keeping your, your forages healthy and happy and reducing weeds. Um, don't be afraid to spot treat. So, it, you know, sometimes it doesn't really make sense to go into uh, a pasture to, um, you know, to treat it a whole pasture when maybe you only have a very small area that's problematic. So just treat that small area. Um, and you can maybe even do that with some smaller equipment that you might have access to. Um, and again, it would save you in time and labor if you're just using a smaller area. Um, overseeding thin areas. Um, so our perennial pastures, they will just, doesn't matter how well you manage them, they will decline over the years. It's just the nature of things. Um, so if you're getting thin areas, you can, um, you basically want to fill them in with desirable plants rather than have weeds fill them in for you. Um, so if you're seeing problem areas and thinning areas, um, overseed those areas. Um, you can, you know, use grass species. You can even, you know, clovers are quick to establish and work well in, in overseeding conditions as well. So uh, trying to keep some ground cover on those thin areas will help uh, combat your weed problem. Uh, I put in here sacrifice lots. So when we get into situations where we have a lot of rain, um, you know, you don't want to have your horses out there in your pastures that are they're going to uh, really work the ground up and make it a muddy mess. So have a sacrifice area, keep them inside or on a sacrifice lot until the ground conditions are right uh, to let them go back onto um, your pastures. And then finally, scout your pastures and pay attention to what's going on. No, nothing beats ground proofing things, so get out there. Really look at how your pastures are performing. And don't do that once a year. Do that continuously because you're going to see different types of weeds and different types of problems appear in your pasture depending on the time of year that it is. Um, so get out there, get ahead of the problem, um, and really pay attention to what's going on. You know, if you have issues, you have questions, <clears throat> you can always contact us at the Extension Office. Um, we'd be glad to help you out with any resources or information that you may need. So this is my final slide here. My contact information is found at the top, my phone number and email address. You can always feel free to contact me if you ever need anything regarding pastures uh, or any of our Extension agents. We'd be glad to help you out. Uh, and those are some links to our Facebook page, um, our equine extension page, as well as um, our YouTube channel as well. So with that, I'd like to thank you guys for tuning in and I will take questions. I see in the chat. So much, Andy. We do have several questions okay. showing up here in the chat. Um, I can go through them or if you'd like to scroll back up and, and look at those. All right, I see them. <laughs> All right. So Sharon asked any recommendations for grass species for Central Maryland. Um, so again, this is going to come down to your soil types, and it's going to come down to how well drained your your soils are. It's going to come down to how productive those soil types are, as to what you can grow there. Um, in Maryland, we are in a transition zone between uh, the cooler northern climates and the hotter southern climates. So we can grow um, a lot of different stuff. We can grow both cool season grasses and we can grow warm season grasses. Um, but typically, our most of our perennial pastures in Maryland and in this region are going to be dominated by cool season grasses uh, because we tend to get 
pretty nice, cool, moderate weather in the spring, and then you tend to get that again in the fall. Uh, so that's why a lot of our pastures are full season grasses. Um, I would recommend looking at either Amanda's presentation or um, that uh, resource that I linked to earlier in this presentation can really help you narrow down exactly what type of grass you should seed um, in your pastures uh, based on your soil types and, and fertility and such. We'll get back to that page. Um, I will say up front that, uh, you know, orchard grass is considered one of our, our more preferred um, grass species because it's very palatable. Um, you know, horses like it, but it can be very finicky. Um, it tends to really need high fertility soils. It needs a lot of management. Um, it needs well-drained soils. Uh, so that might not be a really good option if you have sort of marginal location. Uh, you would want something that's more adaptable. Um, tall fescue is one of our most adaptable forage species, meaning that it can tolerate a wide range of conditions um, and still produce good forage and good growth. Um, if you do have brood mares, you need to be uh, a little bit cautious of, of tall fescue because of the uh, the toxin that it, that it can produce. Um, and the toxin that it produces is related to a fungus that colonizes its roots. And you can actually get tall fescue varieties that have a friendly type endophyte uh, in it, which is good because you get the benefits of, of having the adaptability, but you're not getting the toxic side effects. Um, so Again, I can't answer that question without seeing your, your specific situation. Um, and I would really recommend looking at um, this reference here that the, the guidelines for seeding can really help you. Um, the presentation that Amanda gave will be of a good resource. And if you want to follow up, just ask me and um, with some more information, I can help you out the best I can. Um, the next question is, where do you learn about chemical toxicity and horse death? Um, so I'm assuming you're referring to um, horses that may have been exposed to uh, a chemical and then you know had had some sort of adverse health effect. Um, there are some known effects with some of these herbicides. Um, and you really need to pay attention to the labels and use them as directed because in some instances there are certain chemistries that have uh, restrictions as to how soon you can let your animals go back and graze um, those, those treated areas. So um, again, you're going to find that information on the herbicide label. Um, but you can also find that information in this guidebook as well. It'll list the restrictions right there for you. Uh, makes it easy to find and easy to reference. Uh, so we have another comment about um, not wanting to turn horses out with uh, on pastures that are sprayed with restricted pesticides. Um, I will say right off the bat there, um, some pesticides are restricted and some pesticides are uh, general use pesticides, which means they're not restricted. So um, if it's a restricted pesticide, that means that you need to have a private pesticide applicator's license to purchase the product and as well as to apply the product. Um, if it's a general use pesticide, which, um, which a lot of these chemis chemistries actually are, um, you can purchase them and use them as prescribed by the label uh, without any type of licensing. Uh, and all, again, you need to pay attention to the label and follow it because it's going to outline the safety precautions you need to take. Um, there was a comment that many of these pesticides no longer kill the weeds. Um, one comment um, regarding that is obviously there is concern of of resistance building up in weeds to different chemistries. So if we repeatedly use the same chemistry over and over again, you're going to push weed species towards resisting that chemical. Uh, a good example of this is Roundup. 
that we saw um, basically in the agronomic world. Um, but really Roundup still works fairly well in a lot of our pastures, in a lot of our weed species. Um, and a lot of our um, chemistries that we do have available to us now, uh, yes, they're old chemistries, um, but for certain pasture weeds, um, they still perform pretty well. And you can see, again, relative effectiveness in a lot of these chemistries here on these different charts. Um, so again, speaking to resistance, yes, you're right. You, you always need to be cognizant of that, rotate different modes of action. So you can see right here, site of action number, everything that has the same number here in this column or this row has the same mode of action. So what you would wanna ideally do is rotate different numbers to rotate different modes of action. That way you're not building resistant populations to weeds in your pastures. Um, also talking about natural methods to kill weeds. So uh, I touched on a lot of that and really a lot of the natural controls for weeds, that's gonna be the bulk of your weed control in a pasture. It's gonna be proper mowing, it's gonna be proper clipping, it's gonna be proper grazing management, it's gonna be proper fertile uh, fertility, it's gonna be proper um, liming. Uh, all those things to promote really good pastures and growth is, is really what we're talking about. These chemical options can be a, a good um, option for you, but as I mentioned to start this presentation, um, there's no one, one size fits all. There's no silver bullet for any of this. Um, so chemistry is not um, the end all be all answer to everything. So it really needs to be an integrated approach with all the methods that we talked about. Um, there's a comment about, um, uh, certified organic, uh, let's see. So the comment about certified organic, I'm not, if you want to elaborate on that, I'll answer, but I don't really see a question there. Um, are there, I think Andy, the, the um, point was more just, are there other methods that could be used for someone who is trying to do things in a, a certified organic operation with pasture and hay, um, what, what other options would be available to them? Sure. So like I stressed, you know, the other, the other weed control principles are going to be basically the tools in your toolbox. Um, proper management, proper milling height, proper clipping, um, selecting the right species for the site. Um, there are some certified organic chemicals that you can use, but they're not particularly effective on weeds, on a lot of weeds. They can be very finicky. Uh, so you really need to concentrate on keeping that forage as happy and healthy as you possibly can um, and starting clean with a clean seed bed um, and really not allowing those weeds to, to take hold and become a problem to begin with. Um, let's see. There's a comment about the private applicator class um, about uh, how to properly handle and use restricted use pesticides. So yes, again, if you're gonna be using anything that's restricted use as a pesticide, you need to become certified. And that class is offered through all of our extension offices um, and also through Maryland Department of Agriculture in order to be certified to do that. Um, yeah, so another good point is weeds can be burned and steamed. Um, so yeah, you can take a propane torch out there and you can burn weeds. Um, that is a organic control method. Um, but obviously that's also gonna hurt whatever was growing there that was a beneficial species. So if you're gonna do that, you're gonna then need to fill in those spots with uh, a desirable forage species or else you're gonna expose that ground for a weed to come in. Um, and a comment was made about tillage. Uh, tillage can be both a, a very good uh, weed control tool and also can be a, a weed control nightmare. Um, so tillage obviously buries weeds, but it also brings up weed seeds that were buried uh, to the surface. And when we're talking about a pasture system, um, not too many folks are getting out mobile plows to, to turn over their pastures. 
Uh, we're typically trying to keep them in production if they're a perennial pasture for you know multiple years. Um, tillage can become an option if you're using annual species to graze. I didn't talk anything about annuals, but um, you know, if you're going to be using and grazing annuals, obviously tillage could be something that you could work into a weed control program when you're grazing annual species. But that's typically not something we see so much in horse pastures, um, more so common in, in the dairy or beef industry. So I don't see any more questions in the chat. I don't know if I missed any, Jen. Um, I think you got all of them. If you want to put your last slide up with your contact information again, and we can end with that. Yeah, so thank you guys so much for your participation. Um, and if you guys have any questions, as soon as I get to this last slide, um, <laughs> feel free to shoot me an email or give me a phone call. We can chat, um, whatever you'd like. So thank you guys. Thank you so much, Andy. I know that was a, a lot of information and we have um, certainly within extension done day long seminars versus just trying to put everything into a one hour presentation about various methods of weed control depending on the exact um, pasture or crop that we are trying to, to grow. So I appreciate you trying to, to get as much information as you could in the time that we had allowed for today. Hopefully those of you who um, were able to ask questions um, were able to get them in. It looks like we had one more real quick. If you want to address Andy about um, herbicides for pastures or hay fields, manures composted, um, uh, if graze on is used for pastures or hay fields and manure is compost, as I've read, the chemicals are compounded. I did not see that question come up earlier, so I think we missed it. And certainly, um, we know that there are certain herbicides that um, are not recommended to be put back onto pastures after. Right. Yeah, after so, so, uh, yeah, sorry, I missed that. But uh, I didn't see that. Yeah, that, that, you are, that is correct. So there are certain chemistries that... Um, Basically, they don't degrade when it when it's in um, when it's in the 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 gut and the intestinal tract of of uh, livestock. Uh, Grazon is one of them. Um, there's some other herbicides um, uh, that contain uh, aminoclop. I can't. The chemistries are impossible for me to pronounce. But there's three different ones um, that. That sort of fall into this category. And again, it's going to be on that herbicide label that uh, will tell you these restrictions. Um, so again, if you're using those, um, if you're going to be collecting manure that was treated with any of those products, it's going to tell you on a label that you shouldn't apply that back to a pasture or into a uh, or into a garden or a compost because it's going to inhibit the germination and growth of, of plants. Okay, so yeah, really good point and something to pay attention to, which is why it's really important to always read and follow the label on any of these products. Again, yes, definitely when you're using chemicals, if you are, if you choose to use chemicals as part of your weed control, the labels are very important in understanding how to use it, when to use it, and what restrictions there are on your animals and also on the collection of manure, et cetera, after that. So good point, nice one to bring up. So I think that, again, that concludes our webinar for today. Um, Andy Nest has left his specific information at the top of this final slide. So if you'd like to contact him with specific questions regarding your forage production or pasture production um, and any particular weed questions that you may have unique to your farm and your situation, please do contact him. I'm sure he'd be happy to help you. And again, we, we tried to just give a, an overview today and knowing that everyone has some very specific needs and very specific concerns that go with their land and their use 
um, that is unique to them. So please feel free to reach out. We're happy to help you and address those questions or get them to the people that can. And Andy's a, a great person to help um, direct you to resources that will help you in the, the kind of weed control you might be needing to work with as you head into the rest of summer and fall. As he said, a lot of these weeds are, are ones that we wanna deal with um, in those coming times of year. So again, our resources are listed on this slide as well. We encourage you that um, if you do use social media to follow us on our Facebook page, we try to make sure that all of our upcoming events and educational opportunities are shown there, as well as sharing things that some of our colleagues in other extension programs in other states are doing. We have quite a few resources on our webpage, um, especially under that resources tab. If you look at the publications page, there's a lot about seeding and growing pastures and forages in particular. So please check that out. And certainly our YouTube channel where we've been trying to increase our resources there and all of the webinars that have been a part of this particular program this year, as well as quite a few others are on that channel. So please subscribe and you will get a notification whenever we post something new and check out the other videos that we have up there that might be useful to you. We thank you all so much for joining us today and hope we were able to answer some of your questions and encourage you to contact us with others that we did not get to. And this concludes our webinars for this month. And we will be sending out some other information to you and look forward to planning some new equine educational materials for you to um, bring up throughout the rest of this year. So thank you all so much for being a part of the series this month and uh, joining us today, and we hope you have a great afternoon.